The one way to determine whether the astronauts are really on the moon is to measure the gravity by observing the time it takes for objects to fall. NASA X made sure that there were many such possibilities to determine the gravity by having astronauts needlessly throwing all manners of objects at every opportunity. Here are a few examples of objects being thrown taken from Apollo 16 on the first EVA. In all other missions, we also see the same unnecessary throwing of all manner of objects. I say unnecessary, but for NASA X it was an important aspect of the hoax in order to falsely prove that the astronauts were really on the moon. Gravity of Falling Sand Although NASA X were able to manipulate the videos and respect the lesser gravity on the moon for objects thrown and the jumps of astronauts, they were unable to accomplish this simultaneously for the falling sand. In Chapter 8, Defying Gravity, we also examine the big Navy salute made by astronaut John Young on Apollo 16. As we can see, the astronaut falls according to the gravity of the moon, but the sand falls according to the Earth gravity. It was not possible for the techniques used to fake both of these events at the same time. Here we have a closer look at some of the astronaut jumps all taken from Apollo 16, but you can observe numerous such instances in all of the other Apollo missions. In all cases, the sand clearly falls faster than the astronaut, which is according to the law of physics, impossible. In manipulating the observable gravity of the astronaut, they were unable to simultaneously do the same for the falling sand. So what do we observe from the astronauts behaving as though he is on the moon and the sand behaving as though it is on Earth? This is inconstable evidence of the NASA fakery. When the evidence is so clear and indisputable, how can the pro-NASA fan club members be so blind? It is this blindlessness of the evidence shown by the pro-NASA group that leads one to consider whether they are simply NASA shills and are simply acting disingenuously. Moon Stage Set It is beyond doubt that all of the Apollo moon scenes were recorded in some studio here on Earth. There have been various suggestions made by the skeptics as to the location of the set. Skeptic Bill Casing suggested that the base for the Apollo simulation project was a closely guarded secret base just outside of the small town of Mercury in Nevada, USA. Whenever the moon sequences were filmed, it would need to be a large circular set of up to 300 meters or possibly more in diameter. The one exception that stands out is Apollo 11, the supposed first moon landing. The set for Apollo 11 looks very limited in size and does not show any background features as the following missions do. Apollo 11 did supposedly touch down in a flat area, but there should have been mountain ranges clearly visible in the distance as discussed in Chapter 6, Visions of a Moon. I have no evidence for this suggestion, as it is merely a hunch, but it may be possible that the Apollo 11 video was shot at Pinewood Studios in England. Remember that 2001 A Space Odyssey did have a moonscape scene based on NASA detailed data. It could have been a test for NASA X to judge whether the hoax would look acceptable on video. In all of the Apollo videos supposedly taken on the moon, we have no idea whether the astronauts shown are the real astronauts or merely actors. We can never see their faces as the gold-covered visor is always down. However, there is just one exception to this. In Apollo 17, the claimed last man on the moon, Eugene Cernan, for one brief moment, has his visor up and you can just about make out a face which could be him. We do not even know whether the voices in the videos were recorded at the same time of the video or added later. Certainly, some of the commentary made by the astronauts in the videos is somewhat benign and perhaps not what we would expect from a trained astronaut on a scientific mission. The remaining Apollo missions were clearly filmed on a much larger, specially constructed set which had gantry cranes above for the suspension of the astronauts on wires. As I have stated previously on Apollo 11, it did not appear to use the same wire suspension technique nor as far as I can discern from the front screen projection technique. A revealing insight into the Apollo moon stage set is given in the Make Believe Smoke and Mirrors video which I mentioned above as shown in this extract from this video. The simulated low gravity on the moon caused other problems for the astronauts and is one reason for their rather strange bunny hopping locomotion is that they had insufficient friction at their feet. So what is friction? Let's start with some school physics on the friction of walking. Friction when walking is simply the force created between your shoes and the ground, and it is the force that stops you falling over. But as the slipperiness of the surface increases, then you need to take smaller and more cautious steps in order to maintain your balance. Go try walking on some ice and try some other variable slippery surfaces and you'll see what I mean. The formula for friction is 
F equals UG, where U is the coefficient of friction between your foot or shoes and the surface that you are walking on, and G is the force you exhibit on the ground, your weight. Note that the coefficient U depends on two surfaces that are in contact, the material of your shoe soles and the nature of the ground. Typically, for synthetic material shoe soles on concrete or asphalt, the coefficient in the average range is 0.6 to 0.75. Did you ever try walking on ice? Well, the coefficient of ice is between 0.1 and 0.15, depending on the roughness of the ice. So when you walk on ice, you tend to slip, as shown in this video above. This would have significant problems for the astronauts on the moon, as described by Steve the Chemist in this YouTube video above. The simulation of the lesser gravity on the moon by use of suspension wires resulted in the astronauts having less frictional support at their feet. It is also the reason why toddlers take smaller steps when they first start to walk. We never see the astronauts bent over to keep their balance as one would expect when you are carrying a backpack equal to your own weight. Note that the static balance effect is the same irrespective of the actual weight, as it is a function of dynamics and not weight, so any argument that everything weighed six times less on the moon is completely missing the point. The limited friction that the astronauts had when the counterbalance weight was larger resulted in them to have a tendency to bounce rather than walk. You see this unusual bunny hopping locomotion very often in the Apollo moon videos. The problem with moon dust. The topic of moon dust has been debated continually ever since NASA published the now iconic photograph of the distinctive boot print made by Buzz Aldrin from the Apollo 11 mission. The skeptics argued that it would not be possible to leave such a distinct boot print in the dry dust of the moon. Therefore, we suggest that the moon dust might have been damp, which we know would be impossible on the moon, which has no atmosphere, as any moisture would instantly evaporate. The scientific word for moon dust is regolith, which simply means the loose material covering the solid rock on a planet. On Earth, we call it organic soil or sand. The word regolith is derived from the combination of two Greek words, regos, which means blanket, and lithos, which means rock. You never know, this might be useful information on your next holiday to Greece if you run out of meaningful conversation. The ProNASA group will explain to you that the regolith on the moon is totally unlike anything here on Earth. On the moon, there is no weathering by wind, rain, or ice, so that the regolith particles are not rounded but are sharp and jagged. Accordingly, this jagged theory is offered as a reason why the grains of sand appear to stick together, whereas round grains would just collapse and slide away. The ProNASA Mythbusters produced a TV show in which they engineered an experiment conducted in a vacuum chamber in an attempt to prove that the photograph of the boot print made by Buzz Aldrin on the moon was genuine. For the experiment, they obtained an Apollo moon boot from NASA and some simulated moon regolith. The Mythbusters appear to have convinced themselves that they had managed to replicate a similar boot print in simulated moon regolith. The Mythbusters then constructed a rig in a vacuum chamber and made a boot print which they claimed to reproduce the Apollo moon boot print exactly, but you can judge for yourself how successful they were from the following comparative photograph. In the photograph we have above, the actual boot print made by Buzz Aldrin on the moon and below the Mythbusters attempt. Notice in the real Apollo moon boot how sharp the edges of the imprint are. The Mythbusters boot print have no sharp edges mainly because the sand is dry and therefore cannot leave a sharp edge, so in effect, the Mythbusters may have proved the opposite of what they intended. Oily sand. NASA X would have had concerns that the sand on the Earth would form dust clouds if the particles are suspended in the air. The solution was to add a small amount of light oil in the sand. This has the effect of eliminating the dust clouds, but still giving the sand the appearance of separate grains. You can try it for yourself. Go and buy a bag of sand and then add a very small amount of thin oil to it, say vegetable cooking oil. Experiment with the amount of oil to achieve the moon dust consistency. You will have then produced your own moon regolith. Notice that it is quite sticky and adheres to almost everything. The addition of a small quantity of oil solved the problem of the dust clouds, but also caused a severe problem for the astronauts in that the sand stuck to everything. You see it all the time in the NASA videos covering the astronaut suits and even adhering to the side of metal objects, equipment, and even the side of the moon buggy. This would have not happened if the sand was only jagged. The astronauts complained of the dust problem getting into the lunar capsule. 
They could not brush it off as the oil caused it to be very sticky and would have required detergent to remove it. NASA X needed to mention this problem with the moon dust as it was glaringly apparent from the videos that it stuck to almost everything. The Evidence In creating the evidence to support the fake Apollo moon landings, NASA X could be commended on achieving such a great job considering the extremely limited resources available back in 1969. Certainly, it had fooled the majority of the people for 50 years and still fools a large gullible proportion of the population. However, it was not all perfect as we have seen so far in this series. There are so many weaknesses in the evidence which totally expose the deceit. There are still those, however, who no matter what the evidence shows us, will steadfastly cling to the belief that the Apollo astronauts did reach and walk on the moon. One needs to question this mentality adopted by seemingly intelligent people who are supposed experts in the Apollo evidence. How can this group of pro-NASA experts watch the Apollo videos and not see the glaring inconsistencies and the telltale evidence of fakery? Lights, camera, action! All the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. William Shakespeare, as you like it. The Apollo missions were controlled predominantly at the Mission Control Center in Houston. You can see the complexities of this setup in the NASA video covering the Apollo 13 mission. All telemetry data came into the center where it was viewed and acted on by the data feed controllers. Any fakery would have had to penetrate the scrutiny of these operatives. We have patiently examined this piece or that piece of the evidence which shows conclusively that the Apollo moon landings were faked by NASA X. We have examined the photographs, studied, watched the videos, read documents, listened to the opinions and interpretations from experts and laymen alike. None of this answers the question of how they made this into an apparent seamless presentation broadcast live to the world. In the preceding chapters, we have shown that there are too many inconsistencies in the NASA evidence for the Apollo missions to have been real, but it still remains to consider how the final fakery was produced. It is certain that the many hours of fake mission video, the faked photographs, the fake moon rocks, and even some of the mission transcripts were produced before the Apollo missions were even started. The problem is, is that we have not yet explained totally how these faked elements could have been used in the practice to produce the seamless viewing of the Apollo missions. The Production Let us examine this in detail. We are dealing with an event that was shown live all around the world and each mission was continuous for several days. For Apollo 11, the event lasted over 8 days while for Apollo 17, it lasted for over 12 days. We witnessed the launch of the Saturn V rocket from Cape Kennedy with or perhaps sometimes without astronauts. We observed the astronauts floating weightless in the spacecraft, we saw them walking on the moon and we saw them return to Earth to the final splashdown. All of this time, they were supposedly in constant contact via both voice and video with Mission Control in Houston. All of this activity was seen by hundreds of people in NASA and millions of others throughout the world. If only a handful of people were involved in the fakery, then in addition to the whole world being fooled, the very people who were supposedly controlling the event minute by minute at Mission Control in Houston and elsewhere were also totally fooled. This appears at first sight to be highly improbable. It is abundantly clear that all of these scientists and engineers in mission control did not know what they were watching was not true. If that is the case, then what telemetry data feeds were they seeing and what TV transmission were they watching? Simulated telemetry We do know that when they designed the control room at Mission Control in Houston, it was necessary to test the complete system using simulated telemetry. There is nothing wrong with this, it is a normal practice to test equipment using simulated data. I have done this many times myself in my career. The question then must be, where was the fake data coming from? NASA launched the TETRA satellite, TEST, and T Raining satellite on 13 December 1967. The purpose of the satellite was to simulate transmissions coming from space and the moon so that the controllers at Mission Control in Houston could rehearse the Apollo missions. These simulated transmissions would also be a perfect source for the fake transmissions later to be used on the real Apollo missions. 
The satellite was used to provide simulated data feeds of all the telemetry that would later come from the actual Apollo missions. It was reported by NASA that the TETRA satellite fell on Earth on 28 April 1968, so it could not be used during any of the actual Apollo missions. This is actually disputed by several sources who maintain that it was still operational after April of 1968, so it could have overlapped the initial Apollo missions. You can see the basis of the discussion here on the Clavius website. However, the simple fact is that once the simulated satellite data had been collected, a satellite would no longer be necessary, so whether the TETRA satellite was still operational after 1968 is of no material consequence. The simulated telemetry, possibly with amendments, was subsequently used during the Apollo missions disguised as real telemetry coming from the Apollo spacecraft. The NASA operatives would have no idea where this telemetry was coming from. Numbers on the screen are simply numbers on a screen whatever the source was. There would probably still be actual telemetry coming from the real spacecraft in low Earth orbit, but this could simply be ignored and not broadcast to NASA operatives in mission control. So, let us summarize what we have. 1. A large collection of fake photographs taken on some moon set here on Earth. 2. Hours of fake moon footage filmed on some moon set here on Earth. 3. A collection of fake moon rocks, meteorites probably collected from Antarctica, subsequently modified to hide the evidence of the re-entry through the Earth's atmosphere and then added the telltale zap pits. And fourth, a simulated series of telemetry data obtained by the TETRA satellite and perhaps modified to suit each Apollo mission. The question to be answered is how all of this could be fashioned into some seamless presentation that would fool the world for 50 years and not just once but many times when you include Apollo 8, 10 and the supposedly ill-fated Apollo 13. Several of our skeptics, Bill Casing, Jarrah White, Bart Sabrell, have hinted in their various videos and books on the subject how, in their opinion, NASA achieved the pretense. The final clue they needed was the discovery by Bart Sabrell in the video A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Moon. This was the evidence of the existence of an additional communication channel directly to the astronauts bypassing and therefore unbeknown to mission controller operatives. This was revealed in the talk interruption at elapsed time 3434. Supposedly, the only communication channel was between Houston and the astronauts. However, this voice is clearly neither of them and is uttered in a tone of an important direct order to Neil Armstrong. The finding is significant, but what is perhaps more significant still is the fact that this previously unpublished video was then released by NASA to spacecraft films, but with the talk interruption removed. Why would NASA have needed to have done this if it wasn't in some way incriminating? Quite often we see the deliberate actions of NASA to edit evidence is more revealing than the actual original anomaly. For the skeptics, this was the final piece of the evidence they needed to expose the enigma. They could now complete the whole story of how NASA could have deceived not only its own operatives, but most of the entire world. They had the fake videos of the activities of the moon filmed in some stage set here on Earth as we described in Chapter 12. These videos could then be scripted down to the second. The script could then be controlled by the clandestine team who could instruct the capsule communicator who was the only one allowed to communicate with the astronauts. He could then appear to have been communicating with the astronauts in the fake video being played and broadcast to the world. The reality of this direct communication was furtherly cleverly enhanced by NASA and that they often had the capsule communicator giving instructions to the astronauts which they seemingly obeyed. For example, pick up the rock near your left foot. The existence of a correctly timed script made the impossible eminently possible. The only issue was that the capsule communicator had to be in the clandestine group. This was solved by NASA only allowing other astronauts to communicate directly with the astronauts on the so-called moon, therefore the capsule communicator was always another astronaut and surely to be in the know. This NASA said was for safety reasons as only another astronaut could properly interpret what the astronauts were saying or doing. So there we have it. A complete understanding of how NASA deceived the entire world and most of its own employees. The improbable turned out to be the probable. But this denoted a foregone conclusion. William Shakespeare, Othello. 
I would imagine that back in 1972, NASA X must have been feeling confident that they had successfully achieved the greatest hoax in history as they had seemingly convinced the whole world of the great achievement of advanced American technology. However, there were a few voices in the wilderness that cast doubts on the truth of the matter. People like Bill Casing and Ralph Fernay, but they could be ignored as attention-seeking cranks. After all, they have been conspiracy theorists since time began. What NASA X could not have imagined was the rapid development of the internet and the power that this gave to the ordinary individual to carry out their own investigative research into the Apollo missions. It is often said that it is easier to prove that something didn't happen than to prove that it did. This is the case with the Apollo moon missions. At the first cursory glance, the evidence is all there to prove that the Apollo missions actually reached the moon, not once, but nine times, although they had only claimed to have landed on the lunar surface six times. However, it is the errors in this imperfect fakery that enables us to be confident in our conclusion that these missions were in fact faked. In this video, we have examined the evidence for the fakery and have shown conclusively that the Apollo astronauts have never reached the moon. It is certain that the Apollo astronauts never traveled any further into space than low Earth orbit. In this video series, we have also highlighted several instances which indisputably reveal the fakery. It would appear that not all is well within NASA, so perhaps we should take any new announcements of goals with a pinch of salt. We may know the answer in 2024 if astronauts finally reach the lunar surface for the first time. Time. Time.